Welcome to Daily Dose of Aramaic Grammar Lessons. This is Lesson 11, Introduction to Verbs, Part 1, Tense, Aspect, and Modality. And further information on this topic can be found in Biblical Aramaic for Biblical Interpreters, pages 80 to 87. Let's get started. So tense, aspect, and modality. These three concepts are interrelated and they have to do in some way with verb ideas in every language of the world. So to talk about this in relationship with Biblical Aramaic especially, I'm going to use an arrow. This concept is not unique to me. I'm following John Cook's time in the Biblical Hebrew verb in using an arrow. We can kind of think of this as an action taking place through time, where there's a former time on the left and a later time on the right. So that's why it's an arrow and not merely a line, something like that. Now, tense aspect and modality refer to different things. Let's talk about tense first. Tense locates an action in time. So you see, I've placed the arrow on the left side of the screen. And on the bottom with that red line, I'm expressing a left to right movement of time from some past to some future. And those ideas are defined in relationship to a certain reference time, which may not necessarily be the present of the speaker or a writer, but a speaker or a writer can refer to some other time and time relative to that. So someone can speak of time in the past and what was once future but is now past, for instance. And these intricate time expressions are a matter of tense. It is possible to express these ideas in every language of the world, and there may or may not be a specific means within the verb system itself to do it. But this is a very understandable idea in English because we tense all of our verbs. And of course, actions need not only take place in the past, but can go through whenever the reference time is to the future. So this idea of moving through time and being able to place the performance of an action or the carrying out of an action in time is the idea of tense. What about aspect? Well, again, I'm representing a verb idea with this arrow. And aspect has to do with either a complete action which is to say from beginning to end and all parts in the middle, or we could say a slice of the action. It's not really the entire action viewed from outside, so to speak, but the action considered as part of the action. Now, this idea specifically is called viewpoint aspect in modern linguistics. And it's not just per se that slice that I've shown on the screen, but a slice anywhere along the line of that action. So um, the first example I gave of looking at the entire action from beginning to end, from outside, so to speak, is called perfective viewpoint aspect. And what I'm showing here on the screen, not considering the entire action, but a part of it in this somewhat abstract way, is imperfective viewpoint aspect. What about modality? Well, modality has to do with what is real versus what is irreal, that IR prefix that I've just placed there. Not really what's unreal, because unreal things don't even typically have the poten potential to be real, like imaginary only. But irreal, that word has been coined in linguistics to refer to the world of potential, the wor world of modality. And if you monitor your own speech through the day, you'll notice that you actually use modal expressions almost all the time. So let's, let's talk about this from a framework that I've set out in my book, Modality in the Biblical Hebrew Infinitive Absolute. There are two main kinds of modality that almost all literature refers to. The first one is epistemic modality. Epistemic modality has to do with the degree, or I should say the strength, of assertion. So on the left of my gradation here, this bar, is where there's no proposition that's being asserted at all. And then on the right, an indicative. 
expression, meaning there's no possibility that whatever's being expressed is not true or real. So in between is a sliding scale of potential. So we might think of on the left, something may be true. So, I mean, of course, in an absolute sense, may could mean anything, but usually that is a, not as strong an assertion as something uh, that will be true. Yes. You know, there's more assertive power in saying something will be true. Maybe even a deductive conclusion from certain principles about something that has happened. And then we get to must. This must be true. Well, that, that's a lot stronger than merely something that something might or may be true, for instance. So these English words are just merely expressing concepts about assertion strength that are present in all languages of the world. So we should expect to see them in the Bible as well. That's epistemic modality. There's also deontic modality, which has to do with the degree of compulsive force that a given expression encodes. So on the left of, again, this gradient, is the idea of there's really no deontic event, but all the way on the right is a command, an imperative, where we're saying for the purpose of simple explanation here, there's nothing really stronger than do it as far as a compulsive force in language, okay? And then the sliding scale here in English is using some of the same words that we've already seen for the expression of epistemic modality, right? May and must. So. In this case, may is granting permission. So this is like in the book of Genesis, from any tree in the garden you may eat. So there's really no compulsion or very little compulsion. It's just opening the gates to somebody to go through. But then there's more compulsive force that's applied when one says you must do something. Okay, there's a moral oughtness that's being communicated with must. And then shall, at least in American English, is getting very close to a command. You shall do something. Okay? So this is the imposition of compulsive force on the part of a speaker, communicator, writer. All right? So these, these are the main kinds of modality. And the key here is that whether it's epistemic modality, talking about possibility, or deontic, both are talking about the world of potential because these gradations of strength of command or permission granting and so forth are about things, events that have not happened yet. So God says to the human couple from any tree in the garden, you may eat. Well, they haven't eaten yet, eaten yet at that moment. So we're still talking about the world of potential, regardless of which type of modality we're talking about. The world of potential versus the world of the real. So even a command don't murder in the Ten Commandments. Well, the murder being prohibited hasn't happened yet. Don't do it. Okay, so the whole idea with modality is the world of the irreal potential. Now, an important topic to cover as we close out our discussion of tense aspect and modality is the idea of prominence among them. In the book, the prominence of tense aspect and mood, DNS bot, lies out the premise that many of the languages of the world we can place in a typology as to which of these categories is most pervasive, is most commonly expressed, is kind of the controlling idea in the expression of verbal ideas. So a, a non-controversial assertion is that English is a tense prominent language. This is significant because, of course, I'm speaking English right now. And even when we are talking about a language that does not express tense as prominently as English, if we're speaking English, we're coloring that discussion with our tense prominent language. We have no choice. We're speaking a tense prominent language. This could cause problems when, of course, we're speaking of Hebrew and if we believe an aspect prominent theory for how the biblical Hebrew verbal system works, such that the perfect verb form expresses perfective viewpoint aspect, and the imperfect view, the verb form is expressing imperfective viewpoint aspect. That's the view that Biblical Aramaic for Biblical Interpreters takes about the Biblical Hebrew 
verbal system. Interestingly, it's not uh, a 100% consensus, just like with Biblical Hebrew, but uh, many Aramaists believe that Biblical Aramaic is expressing tense primarily through its verbal system. Now, it bears saying right now, again, any idea can be expressed in any language, basically. So can Hebrew, with its aspect prominent verbal system, express ideas of tense? Well, absolutely. In fact, the Vayik Tol uh, is arguably a narrative past tense that has a default perfective aspect. Now we go over to Aramaic. If we have, sort of like English, a tense-based system, does that mean that the Aramaic verbal system cannot express default aspects or modality in any way? Absolutely not. So just as English can express perfective and imperfective viewpoint aspect, and English can express with the aid of auxiliary verbs like may or must or should or shall, can express modality. Likewise, Aramaic has strategies for doing this. So it's just important in our discussion that's coming up about the biblical Aramaic verbal system that we ground ourselves in these theoretical concepts to understand that biblical Aramaic expresses tense aspect and modality. And just we're going to assume, based on some scholarship, that the main idea with the Aramaic verbal system is going to be tense, whereas in Hebrew it is aspect. Okay, so that was a very quick introduction to the ideas of tense aspect and modality, and there are more important topics as well to be covered in part two. So let's stick around, let's continue our introduction to verbs in part two of lesson 11.